Let us pray. God of mercy, grace, and peace, we thank you for the wonders of Jesus. We thank you that in Jesus we have been reconciled to you. We rejoice in the lavish grace you have poured over us. Let our hearts be ever more turned toward you. Let our feet walk ever closer to the path your Son set before us. Let our ears be open to the call of the Spirit. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Paul has gotten a really bad reputation over the last few thousand years. It's not uncommon for good Christian people to argue against Paul. They say that he is responsible for all the ill treatment of women in the church. They say his rules about how to live are harmful to those that God created differently. There is a good deal of blame heaped on Paul. And I have a secret for you. <laughs> We're mad at the wrong person. Paul was a radical Jesus follower. He began his life as a Pharisee. That meant that he studied Scripture, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, extensively. He was a true believer in the God who showered loving kindness on God's chosen people. He ordered his life to obey all the commandments in Scripture. As a side note, there are way more than 10 or 11 commandments, depending on how you count them. Today, the rabbis count over 600. And yes, those rules are, are the interpretation of the original 10 or 11, but they held the same power as those first few. They were identity markers. They were ways to keep God's people pure in a world that was not pure. They told people how to act and how to do commerce and how to deal with immigration issues. They explained the proper way to deal with illness. And they didn't even have prior authorization clauses. Paul was steeped in this. He was steeped in a lifetime of study and conversation. He was a true believer. So much so that he wanted to stomp out that Jesus cult that was springing up all over the place. That Jesus cult was a dangerous thing after all. His followers were running around claiming that he had risen from the dead. Now, the Pharisees believed in resurrection of the dead, but not like that. These people were foolish, and they were leading people astray, and Paul was going to stop that. And it was on one of these missions to persecute the early Jesus followers that Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. Paul came face to face with something he could not analyze away. Jesus found him, and Jesus changed him, and Jesus sent him out to change the world. So yeah, Paul was not a meek and mild man. He was not at all attractive by today's standards. He was bent over with knobby knees, worn out from a thousand missionary journeys. His hands were scarred from making tents. But through Jesus and the inspiration of the Spirit, he shared the gospel of Jesus. He told people over and over that while they were sinners, God loved them so much that Jesus came to reconcile us to God. He told them it was okay if they broke a commandment because the law did not have the power to set them free. Jesus had done that. Jesus' blood spilt on the cross had dissolved the barrier between people and God. And even more than that, through Christ, there was no longer Jew or Greek, free or slave, male or female. And he meant it. 
he sent Onesimus, an enslaved person, to his owner so that the owner could make him a brother. Paul listed so many women as his co-workers that it's shameful how the church has obscured it. There was Prisca, who is mentioned six times in Scripture with her partner Aquila, and she is listed first four of these times. That wasn't politeness. That was her ranking as the leader of the pair. And there were many other women, Lydia, Junia, so on. Paul really believed and taught the radical equality of Jesus. And then we get to this letter, the one written to the Ephesians, the one that talks about how women are supposed to submit to their husbands, the one that has sparked so many memes with umbrellas, you know, the Jesus and the, yeah, okay. Okay. The one that has been used to weaponize Jesus against people who are struggling. The one that's been used to create a hierarchy in the church and in the family. And we go, what's up with that, Paul? Did you not mean what you wrote in Galatians? And the short answer is that most scholars do not believe that Ephesians is a true Pauline letter. It was most likely written several years after Paul's life, and it was written for a different purpose. It was written to help the new Christ-following church learn how to live in the world where the dominant power was the Roman Empire. What the church was saying and doing was so antithetical and so anti-governmental that if they did not adapt to society in some manner, they would be wiped out before they could flourish. It's hard for us to imagine such a situation. Even today when certain brands of the news try to tell us that Christians are being discriminated against, we really aren't. We're still free to meet in these lovely buildings. We're still free to pray. And we even have one up on our Muslim brothers and sisters because we can pray And no one can tell when we're doing it. We don't need a rug and space to bow our bodies. We can pray anytime, anywhere, and no one can stop us. Our meat doesn't come from Aphrodite's temple, so we don't have to decide to be vegetarian so we don't mislead our weaker sibling in Christ. We're not at risk of being excluded from business deals because we won't go to pagan festivals. We are free to follow Christ, and it is a beautiful thing. But the church in Ephesus, or any of the smaller towns around, didn't have that luxury. We're seeing here an evolution in Christian thought from first-generation Pauline theology to second-generation. We're seeing what happened when Jesus did not immediately return And people had to adapt to the world as it is while still following Christ. We can make peace with Paul because while this is written in Paul's language and Paul's thoughts, it comes from a different time and place and relies on Paul's name for its authority until it became part of our canon and was imbued with the authority that comes from that. So the letter begins with a giant run-on sentence in the Greek. The English translators have done us a favor and parsed it into digestible smaller sentences. And true to the letter-writing conventions of the time, the greetings continue, contains a rundown of what's going to be discussed in the letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, begins the letter. This was a statement of belief, front and center. This is heresy to the Jews and heresy to the Romans. This sentence is a declaration about who is in charge of the world and everything in it. The author is not holding back or gently leading the reader to discover. This is 
in your face, 16 point bold typeface, Jesus is Lord, not the Romans. And that's the ultimate point. There is no entity that is Lord of our lives except Jesus. And Jesus tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We are free to live in the grace of Jesus. We're free to drink deeply from the font, to dance in the river of life. We are so loved by the one who created everything that we do not need to fear anything. We do not need to fear death or taxes or elections or any of it. Jesus is Lord of Lords. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the one who opened the gates of heaven and said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Beloved, put down your burdens. Take up your cross. Rejoice today. You are free. God is doing a new thing in your life. God is healing the broken parts of your body and your soul. God is mending relationships. God is providing for your needs. God is gathering your tears in a bottle because they are so precious. Refuse to be downtrodden. Refuse to give in to the call of despair. You are free, free indeed. Now go out and live freely in the face of all the nonsense. And for this, the world will say, thanks be to God. Amen.